Hello and welcome to the Cancer Interviews Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Foster, and on this episode, I have the honor of introducing a very courageous young woman from Lima, Peru, who not only overcame cancer at a young age, but went on to compete in one of the world's most difficult and challenging races. It's our hope that you will find her story both informational and inspirational. So please join me in welcoming Gianna Velarde from her home in Lima, Peru. Gianna, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really a joy to share my story. I really hope that people could learn something about it. So it, it's, it's a very, a very ple pleasant interview. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gianna. And before we get into talking about your cancer journey, we would like to get to know more about you, like where you're from, what your interests were as a child, and what your life was like before you were diagnosed with cancer. Well, now I'm 26 years, years old. Uh, currently, I'm studying a MOOC program in order, you know, to survive this quarantine. <laughs> I'm actually considering to move to Canada to study and work. The last two years, I've been putting all my effort to develop my business, which is uh, a motor school for kids, teenagers, and adults. My life before I cancer was quite different. I was somehow a depressive girl, probably has to do something with the age, you know, because six, 15 years old, it's always a very hard age for every human being. And when I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with cancer. I wasn't very close to my parents, so cancer actually helped me to create a bond with them, a very strong bond. Well, that's wonderful. So at what age did you start to feel that something was physically wrong with your health, and how did you go about finding out that it might be cancer? Do you remember that? Two years, uh, no, uh, 10 years ago, uh, this H1N1 flu yes. came up to the world. Yes. And, well, and schools here in Peru, they almost have something like a quarantine for a month. And all that month, I spent it on bed. At 7 p.m., I was high fevers and I sweat a lot. I had to change my clothes like three times per night because I sweat a lot. I, lo I lost uh, 10 kilograms in one week. Wow. You know, I, when I call someone by the phone, I usually get, you know, I, I couldn't breathe normally for 10 seconds of speaking. So it was uh, pretty obvious that I was, I, I was getting ill. And then suddenly a big ball appeared here in my neck. It was like, big like very very big and i realized i i had that ball uh, thanks to a friend <laughs> we were like playing soccer <laughs> and i was laughing about about her her ball <laughs> and she she said to me like okay you know uh, my butt is not as big as the ball you have in your neck and in that time i re realized wow i had this on my neck and i didn't realize before and then my grandma took me to the hospital and well, it was cancer. Wow. Well, what specific type of cancer were you diagnosed with and what were your feelings and emotions when you found out? I was diagnosed with lymphoma third stage. At the beginning, I wasn't really aware of what was the meaning of having cancer, you know? I was like a very young girl which only the word the word cancer sound like like very distant you know i wasn't really aware that i, that I had cancer during the days i recognized one feeling in the glance of every people that look at me and that glance had a lot of pity pity you know people always when when they see when they saw me when i was with cancer they saw me with pity pity so that's the, the hardest feeling that I, that I had from, from, my, from my cancer journey. Wow. Well, um, how did you go about determining what the best treatment options were for your type of cancer? Well, I haven't had a lot. <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, 
cancer treatments were very limited. Now I, I know that people have more options like pills or anything else that's not chemo. So my treatment had to do something with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I had 16 chemo and 32 radiotherapy. Wow. My hair is falling, but I never shaved. I wasn't that brave. Actually, one of the most hard things that I had to endure in my life was losing my hair. Sure. Well, I remember from personal experience, uh, my hair came out and it would come out on my pillow at night. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, there would be all this hair on my pillow. So it's. Yeah, that, that happened to me a lot. You know, I, I woke up and I looked my pillow and I saw like big pieces of hair and it was very awful. And when I look at me at the mirror, you know, this kind of mirror, I, I saw that the back of my head was, you know, like a, it looks like a, like I was an old person, you know, that his hair or, or her hair falls apart. But I saw that in me when I was 15 years old. So it, it was pretty hard to, to endure. Oh, sure. And at that age, it's even more difficult, I'm sure, than yeah. any other age. But the, the good news is it looks like your hair grew back. And um, uh, yeah. that's a positive. Yeah, that's a positive. Where did you undergo your cancer treatments, and how long did that last? Um, well, I took my, my cancer treatment in the clinic in Langlo Americana. This is it's a Peruvian clinic here, a very good one. And it took me a year, a year to beat this disease. Did you have to be hospitalized, or were you able to do it as an outpatient from home? I had to, to be uh, hospitalized, but for the first five chemios, the last ones, uh, I wasn't at the, at the hospital. I mean, I, I went to the hospital, you know, to, to receive sure. the chemo. Yeah, but I, go, I, I went to my home right away. Actually, every time I had chemo, I end up and go to the gym, you know, <laughs> or... Oh, wow. or or going to ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, did, did you mentioned your family? Uh, did you have family and friends that were able to provide day-to-day uh, -day help uh, during your treatments? And what can you share with us about that help and support? One of the things I learned was very obvious. When someone gets sick, uh, it's not that the only one the only one who has this disease is the patient itself himself you know it's actually the whole family and the friends or, or the people who love us who love us sure so there were days where my mom was feeling like you know overwhelmed so bad that they start that she started telling me things that were so pretty <laughs> but you know i recognize that this disease it wasn't only my disease. It, it was the disease for my mother, my father, my grandmother, and all my my family and my friends. Actually, cancer is, doesn't make one hit. It hits all your family and all your beloved ones. Well, that is so true. And for you to recognize that, especially as a young person, um, that is... Uh, uh, that's very impressive that you, you recognize that as a, as a young person. And it does affect uh, everyone around you. And uh, even though you're the one going through the treatments and, and so forth. But uh, you mentioned uh, your hair loss. Uh, what, were, what, what were some of the other side effects uh, that you experienced, if any? And, and how did you deal with those? Well... The first and most important one was my hormonal system. I don't produce hormones due to the treatment of the radiotherapy because I had uh, a cancer, you know, uh, under my stomach, under my stomach. So this has been a fight since the doctor discharged me. I remember my weight was as stable as my emotions, you know. One, one month I could wait, I don't know, 
56 kilograms and then the other month I could weigh 64 kilograms and that's because my hormonal system is like you know like doing this and I had to I had to start the journey to look for some supplements you know for my hormonal system because for a girl a woman it's very important to produce hormones not only for your hair or or to have children sure but for your for your bones for your skin you know to be strong so that's that's a very that's the the hard part of this disease for me the the hormonal my hormonal system because obviously when you finish your treatment you want to be like normal you know have a normal life sure. <laughs> but i have but i have but I, I don't have that because this disease give me this gift <laughs> this awful gift <laughs> of not having a hormonal system stable so that's kind of an ongoing um situation that you are working with working through and working with yeah and since today i i always fight with this with this disease in my hormonal system because it's it's very it's very hard for me to to endure this it's very hard now were you able to continue with school or work and if so what was that like yes i continue all my life i wasn't tempted by the idea of being just a victim of this disease of cancer and that my whole life had to stop because of cancer i i wasn't really going to recognize that so i wasn't going to let that happen of course i missed a few trips with my school but my life continued of course respecting every limitation and caution necessary but I just keep keep going, you know. I I never stop because of cancer. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. I'm sure it's very difficult for someone, especially in high school age, um, dealing with this. So I'm I'm impressed that you had that um, drive to keep going and and so forth. Were there some goals that you had set for yourself while you were undergoing treatments? And if so, um, how did they inspire you? One of the things that helped me to get through that disease was to practice a sport, you know, especially the motorcycle. Oh. When I put my helmet on, I wasn't a girl with cancer, you know. I wasn't even a girl. I was only a rider that try to overcome every obstacle that nature gives, that nature offers. And that feeling really fulfilled the whole emptiness that my cancer was producing in me. That's wonderful. Now, um, we talked a little bit about your lowest points, losing your hair and uh, your hormonal system being affected and so forth. Um, what was it like and, and how did you find out that your treatments had been a success and that your cancer was in remission and what was that experience like? Well, I remember that the best feeling I had uh, since this disease was my last chemo because I really hated the mood of the clinic and the food, you know, the food was for me was unbearable <laughs> so it, it actually was a relief and a big moment for me my last chemo that last feeling that this is not going to happen again is really it's really priceless now did you go on to uh undergo uh radiation therapy or was the last chemo the very last treatment that you received uh -huh. I received 16 chemios and 32 radi ra radiation. Yeah. So that radiation is actually the one that that destroyed my hormonal system. It wasn't actually the chemo. It was the the radios. And that was after the chemo portion or during? After. Okay. All right. Well, when you... Um, finished your radiation therapy 
what did your doctor say and, and how did you know that you would reach the, the end, uh, the successful end of your cancer journey at that point? Well, my doctor always supported me, especially when I, when I ride motorcycle because my mom wasn't aware of that, <laughs> you know. It would be a nightmare if she'll, if she'll discover that when I had chemios, the next day I, I was on the hills trying to climb a big, big <laughs> hill, you know, and, and falling and, and try to get up the, the bike, which is really heavy. So, sure. <laughs> so my doctor was very a good friend for me. He always told me that I shouldn't let my life, I shouldn't stop my life because of cancer. So that's a very strong uh, feeling and an idea that he planted here in my, in my mind. Well, that's, that's great advice that he gave you. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Gianna Velarde from Lima, Peru. And Gianna, at this point, it sounds like you were very fortunate that your cancer journey had been successful. So what was the next big challenge in your life? How did you prepare for it? And what can you tell us about it? Well, the next big challenge was conquering Dakar. It wasn't a heroic participation. <laughs> I had to fight with everything, you know, gather the money and the sponsorship, assemble a good bike to endure all the days, practice navigation. And also I was studying and I had to continue my trainings. And also I have my school, my, my, my business. And you know, I couldn't, I, I, I had to be strong in all those sectors in my life that I want to do at the same time that I was wanted to conquer Dakar. So actually the most difficult was when I broke my collarbone <laughs> two months before Dakar. Yeah, in a training. Before. Thank goodness I could, yeah. I, I broke my, my collarbone here, this one, two months before Dakar. <laughs> Well, for, uh, for someone in our audience that isn't familiar with the, the Dakar Rally, uh, can you just briefly explain what it is? Dakar Rally is the most difficult race in the world. Not because, you know, participation, the participation is very, is very hard, but because all the things you have to do just to be in the in the in the line you know you have to gather the money you have to prepare your body your mind to be alone many hours and to make the decisions by yourself because in the bike you are completely alone and if you are taking the wrong path or you are making a decision with the bike you know i need to rest right now and my bike needs needs to cool down but i have the time against me i have to be in in other place I don't know, like in two hours, and I still have, you know, uh, 100 kilometers to go. So you need to make those decisions and you need to prepare yourself to do all of these things, but by yourself, because you won't have anyone there to give you advice or to tell you, yeah, you should wait, or no, you are taking the wrong path, it's this way. No, you are completely by yourself. So this is why this race is so hard for me. For, uh, this is my opinion, my standpoint. Uh, I think this is a very hard race, not the race itself, but just to be there in the, in the line, just to participate. Just to participate, want to participate, it's very hard. Well, it sounds like it's a very physically challenging race and a mentally challenging race. And how many days is the total uh, Dakar rally? Uh, usually it's uh, about 15 days wow wow now what was the lowest moment in the Dakar rally and uh, what did you learn from that well the lowest moment was when I couldn't cross the finish line in the day three because the engine broke down just six kilometers away from that finish line <laughs> so it was very hard I learned that one person cannot fight the entire world, you know. You always need people who love you and who wants to see you conquer in order to achieve every goal, every dream you have. I know that this race is a race of one, 
but you know all the support and all the love of the people who want to see you conquer, who wants to see you su to be successful, it's really worth it. it. It really makes you feel that you're not alone when you're riding in the desert because you have all the, that people who love you, you know, as a co-pilot. <laughs> sure. What was your favorite memory from uh, the Dakar Rally experience? My favorite memory is the first day. I was so scared and intimidated. However, during the race, I realized that I wasn't the only one nervous, you know? <laughs> I put a Peruvian flag in my jacket, so every time I was riding the desert, Peru was my co-pilot. So the fear actually vanished, and I was full with, you know, bravery, <laughs> with courage. And your uh, Dakar rally was entirely in Peru, is that correct? Yeah, but I only last three days because my engine broke down six kilometers before reaching the finish line of the third day. Pretty frustrating. Well, I'm sorry that happened, but it sounds like you uh, were victorious in the experience, and that's what really counts. So glad you had that experience. Now, you mentioned in a previous interview that I heard online that and I hope I'm quoting this right, but uh, you said, the woman who is leaving is very different than the woman who comes back. Can you expand on what you meant by that? I believe that every great event and understand great event as something very important for, one, for oneself, every great event changes you, change, changes you because you have to overcome obstacles, you have to conquer, you have new failures, you have so much learning that obviously when you go through this experience, you won't be the same person. Every great moment in your life really marks you. And that's what I meant by, you know, the, the woman that is going to left with the Dakar is another woman. Because I, I learned a lot of things I have conquers of course but i also have failures and if you don't fall then you don't fail you don't learn anything at all so that's that's the idea i, I had of this dogger which wasn't a heroic participation as i told you it was actually very frustrating well that's a very profound uh statement and and philosophy and and i'm sure that's going to take you uh, to many great uh, things in your life. What are you currently involved with in your professional and philanthropic charity work? And what do you enjoy most about that? Actually, I have a school where I teach kids and teenagers how to ride a bike. However, I also share, you know, my own experience in order to teach them something more useful in their lives besides, you know, learning how to ride a bike. For example, things don't always, you, you don't always achieve things on the first round. Sometimes you need to get up every time you fall in order, you know, to achieve those goals. But those goals are not going to be easy. Things that are, very, that are really wor worthy are not easy. So that's the things I share with my students in my school. And a few years ago, I actually... I actually teach young ladies, young girls with cancer how to ride a bike because, you know, I was ready to share with them my thought that a girl with cancer, of course, she has cancer, she has a disease, but doesn't mean that she's dead or she's going to be dead or, or, or whatever, or she's a victim. She can actually do pretty amazing stuff like riding a bike. A bike is usually, you know, um, known as a vehicle for death, a death vehicle. <laughs> but it's not actually that. <laughs> it's really, my country people always say, well, if you buy a motorcycle, you also need to buy yourself, you know, a, a grief, you know, um, a place in the cemetery. <laughs> yeah, people say that here a lot. Well, as a fellow uh, rider, amateur rider myself, it is a dangerous sport and you have to be careful and you have to uh, uh, 
you know, to make good judgments uh, when you're writing. So as a, as a goal setter, uh, what are one or two of uh, goals that you have set for yourself for the future? Well, my goal for the future is to find my own way in this new chapter of my life. I recently closed a very important one. To learn that I'm a valuable person that deserves to be loved for what I am and not for from what I what other people believe think is right, you know. So I also would love to write another Dakar, <laughs> maybe two to three years. This coronavirus has changed a lot of things in my life and put an end to many plans I had. So actually, I, I, I have to wait to see what is going to happen. Sure. Well, before we finish our visit today, imagine that there is one person out there somewhere in the world who just found out that they have been diagnosed with cancer. What would you like to say to them? I would say to this person that it's okay to feel bad or sorry for yourself, but don't let these feelings overwhelm you. Every day is the most important race in your life. Every day is a conquest. Remember, you're not a victim of life. Some challenges are only for the ones that are capable to endure them. You have to prove yourself that you are more than capable to endure this disease, even though you don't feel ready. But we need to also remember, no one is ever prepared for an unknown challenge. And cancer is always an unknown challenge. Well, it certainly is. And those are very wise words uh, coming from someone who truly has walked the walk. And so, Gianna, uh, where uh, can our audience learn more about you online or through social media? And is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we uh, wrap things up today? Well, um, thanks everybody for listening to me and your, for your attention, especially, especially you, Jim. I, my English is not as well as it was like 10 years ago. Very good. <laughs> I, hope, I hope my story helped you in any way you guys prefer. Every story, you need to remember this. Every story, every person, every person has a story. And that story is always valuable. And every person has something to teach us. Like we have something to teach someone else. So it's very important to remember that in every, in every aspect of our lives. Is there somewhere on social media that uh, people could learn more about you and or the uh, race experience that you had? Or Yeah, yeah. You could uh, look for me on Facebook or Instagram as Gianna.Velarde. You know, my name, that in my last name. <laughs> sure. Okay. And we'll leave some links uh, to those uh, resources below in the show notes and description on the video. And uh, we, we do appreciate that. And Gianna, thank you so much for taking the time to share your journey and expertise with us today. You truly have an encouraging and inspirational story. And we are so happy for your cancer outcome and continued good health. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I, I hope this is really worth it. It certainly is, and, and you are welcome, Gianna. And for all of you listening to the podcast, please remember that you're not alone. We're all a part of a team, and we wish you the absolute best possible outcome with your cancer journey. So until next time, take care, and we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.